everyone. We, uh, we smuggle the guest on stage as well, and we are instructed to make sure it does not roll down the stairs. So I think we did that uh, successfully so far. All right, so how many people are building something in hardware or something that interacts with the, the real world? All right, a good amount. Um, so I think there's generally a lot of advice about software companies and how to build software companies. And um, I think uh, there's generally a lot of available content on the internet about how to do that. I think there's a lot less on how to do that with, um, with a hardware business or a business that has to go interact with the real world. And there's a lot of other challenges and complexities with that that um, are not often discussed. So. Um, Hopefully, I can share from some of our experiences and some of our challenges, and hopefully, it's useful to, to some of you. So I'll, I'll start with an overview of Coco and um, how it works. So we make these robots that deliver uh, food, groceries, packages. Uh, we're based in Los Angeles, although we did just launch Helsinki this week. So you'll start seeing them rolling around Helsinki. Um, and uh, we're working with Volt here. So if you order food delivery on Volt, you'll, you'll probably uh, get some robots over the next, uh, robot deliveries over the next few weeks. So they navigate somewhere between, depending on where we're operating, between 5 to 20 kilometers an hour. So they use sidewalks, bike lanes, shoulder of the road. You could think of it as the autonomous vehicle equivalent um, of, a, of a bike courier. So that's some video of it driving around uh, in Los Angeles. And um, in, in the US, we work with the major food delivery companies, as well as with restaurants, grocery stores, retailers directly. And we're offering them a solution to deliver to their customers at really high quality, make a really great experience, much more sustainable. Um, but we can do it at a fraction of the cost. And so driving the, the cost of delivery down uh, is incredibly important to keep growing this industry. So um, getting to this point has uh, been quite challenging. This is one of our first uh, early prototypes. And um, the wheels, our biggest problem at the beginning was literally the wheels would always fall off. Um, and so we would constantly have to take turns of who's going to go run out into the middle of the street, pick up the robot, put the wheels back on. Uh, so this is one of our early team members. Um, we actually had a lot of the uh, electronics were in the front of the vehicle. So if it stopped too quickly, it would actually face plant. Uh, and so we'd actually frequently have to go over and, and upright it. Um, there's some things about hardware that make, it, uh, make building a startup, building a product um, at the early stages uh, particularly difficult. The first one is physics is really hard. So you have to deal with not just the world of software. You have to deal with things like water damage, uh, vibration, electromagnetic interference, um, pinched wires. Actually, one of the biggest pain points of starting a robotics company actually is cables uh, and the connectors on cables. Uh, that is uh, notoriously difficult, and I did not expect that to be so hard. Um, snow on the cameras. Uh, we picked a great week to launch. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot of slush outside. Uh, which uh, uh, is another, another challenge, especially compared to sunny Los Angeles, where the weather is always perfect. And by the way, before anyone says anything, these are the summer tires. Uh, we do have winter tires with chains, and they're much larger. But every single Finnish person I've met immediately points out our tires are way too small to work in Finland. Uh, so you will see bigger tires in the near future. Um, uh, and then uh, iterating is very expensive. It's either very expensive or very slow, and sometimes it's both. So you can move faster on iteration, but that usually requires spending a lot more money and be willing to throw out hardware when it doesn't work, which is very expensive. Or you take your time and de design things very methodically um, and try to make it as perfect as possible, but that comes with a lot of other challenges. And as everyone knows, speed is incredibly important at the early stages for, um, for a startup. Um, and relatedly, uh, uh, failure becomes very, very expensive. There's a lot of robot companies that have failed. Raising our first rounds of financing were extremely difficult because there was a lot of companies that had tried to do something like this and hadn't been successful. Um, if you build 1,000 vehicles and they end up not working as well as you anticipated, uh, that can just kill the company because uh, it might cost you another $100 million to go through another cycle of that. So, Hardware companies are very painful, but I think there's some ways, um, I think there's some advice uh, from things we've learned that can um, make this a lot better and actually can make this run a lot more closely to a, to a software company. 
So the first challenge, first, one of the most recent failures was uh, trying to launch in Helsinki. So we were supposed to launch back in August. So I spent a month here between July and August. Um, and we had a lot of unexpected problems as an American company trying to do business uh, in Finland. Um, and this is before the weather got bad. So this is sunny, beautiful weather in the summer. Um, we, um, we were planning to launch with Volts and we had conversations with the, uh, the traffic agencies and the different regulatory bodies. And um, we worked out, okay, here's what's required for launch. And we got sent a copy of the regulations uh, in English. Um, and it turns out the English regulations were different than the Finnish regulations. Um, and we learned very quickly that Finnish people really, really love rules. And there's a lot of them and we had the wrong list. So um, we had to go through uh, a lot of cycles of changing the vehicles before we could launch and before we could get final approval. And as an American company that did not speak Finnish, that made things uh, very challenging. Uh, one example you can see on these, uh, on these vehicles the color of the lights are very, very specific for Finland. They actually don't look like this in LA. Um, and you can see like this corner one actually has two different shades on it. So the front has to be white, the sides have to be yellow, and the back has to be red. It has to be a very specific shade of each of those colors. And any other color is, is, um, is not allowed. So we did a lot of iterations with the, with the city on, on what exactly the vehicle needs to look like, exactly how big everything needs to be. Um, and then got to a place where we were, we were good with the, the regulators to launch. And then there's a lot of nuances about actually operating in the market. So um, there's a lot of intersections here that have kind of three different crossings uh, for pedestrians, right? And some of them change, the lights change at different times. So sometimes the first section of the crossing will change and be green, and the last ones will be red, or this one will turn red faster than the other ones. So we don't have anything like that in Los Angeles. Um, and one thing that you guys have here that's actually really awesome is the bike lanes are on the sidewalks instead of in the roads, um, which is actually amazing because we can travel much, much faster. But um, it means we need to be used to sharing the sidewalks with bicyclists, which does not exist anywhere uh, in the US. We have a uh, very bad bike infrastructure typically in the US. Um, one of the big learnings from this, especially with a, a physical real world product is to hire a local team very quickly. We expected to have someone from LA um, come to Finland to launch the service, to take all of our learnings from the US, um, and then eventually to hire a local team. Um, but the learning here was there's a lot of nuances and a lot of differences, and so it's actually much better to hire a local team who understands the market much faster than we originally expected. Um, so we have uh, Tatu and Sam who are in the audience who are our local team, so shout out to them. They've been incredibly helpful at getting everything running. All right, uh, the second problem. We started this in 2020. Um, and in, uh, in 2021, uh, capital was flowing very freely. Uh, I'm sure you guys have either experienced this or heard about this, but everyone was growth at all costs. How can we get bigger faster? So we went from covering about three square kilometers, um, so delivering across three square kilometers in Los Angeles, to about three, uh, 600 square kilometers in a matter of a few months. And um, with this sort of a business, right, there's a lot that goes into doing that. So we need warehouses in each of these cities. We need a local team in each of these cities. We need vans. We need um, spare parts. We need batteries. Um, you need to map the whole city. So we map out every single detail of every single curb and every single sidewalk and every single bike lane, um, every single construction zone. So we do all that before launching. So going from three to 600 square kilometers um, was incredibly challenging. But we were growing super quickly. The problem was we we're about a year old as a company, and so the hardware, as you can see in the previous slides, just did not work that well. And so we kept having to throw more and more resources at getting to that scale. And then 2022 happened, so interest rates shot up, and uh, investors all of a sudden want to see uh, efficiency, capital efficiency. Let's see you be profitable in all of your deliveries, um, even if it means slower growth. But as a hardware company or a company that operates in the real world, that can be really, really, really difficult. Uh, as I mentioned, there is a lot of infrastructure you have to set up to do this, and you can't just shut down a few servers overnight uh, or cut your customer acquisition spend. 
you actually have to get out of leases, sell the vans, um, and, uh, and, and reshuffle a lot of resources um, when you're trying to become more efficient. Um, and also, like one of the biggest problems to trying to get to profitability is you need the hardware to be extremely reliable. And that is also very expensive. So even to get to a point where you're operating profitably and operating efficiently, you actually often have to spend a lot of money. And that money is upfront in advance of actually getting the, the changes and the improvements built into the hardware. So um, we did our best with this. We, we, we shut down Texas. We had launched across all of Texas. Um, and we ended up um, shutting down Texas. We went back to Los Angeles, and we said, we're going to get really efficient in Los Angeles. Um, and I don't actually believe any company in the world is delivering profitably in Los Angeles right now. Um, it's extremely expensive to move anything around LA. Um, and so we recently, last month, actually became fully profitable in LA. So after a, a few years of a lot of iterations, we got to the point where we're probably the only company delivering profitably in the city of Los Angeles. Um, and I think that's also probably a first for the autonomous vehicles industry. Um, so the, the learning here was the game on the field changes all the time. You get market changes. You, know, you get some new thing becomes hyped, and, uh, and other things become less hyped in the investor world. Um, and then the most important thing as a startup is you have to be extremely adaptable extremely dynamic. You have to play whatever game's on the field. Um, and even if you're a hardware company, there's still no excuse. You have to be ready to make changes and, and uh, adapt extremely quickly. All right, so the, the third fail was back in the day when we had um, very unreliable hardware. We wanted to learn what to build and what to focus on. Um, with robotics, I think robotics founders in particular tend to over-engineer everything. Uh, these are super fun to engineer, and there's a lot of really cool things to build. And so if you're a founder in robotics, uh, you might get very excited about building all of the fancy uh, you know, AI self-driving, uh, add a million lasers on this thing, and all of a sudden your vehicle costs $300,000, and it still doesn't work. Um, so we wanted to be very thoughtful about exactly what should we build and what should we prioritize building. Um, and the only way to do that is actually just to ship the product. Um, and that's like conventional advice in software and maybe not so conventional in hardware. Um, but as I said earlier, like being, being slow can also be extremely expensive and it can be deadly for a startup. So you just have to know that you're going to have to iterate it through it really quickly and just ship things as often as you can to customers. So we invented this, uh, this term ended up sticking around for a while. Um, it's called Mike's Plumbing. Um, to maintain the customer magic when the robot failed, one of us would take turns literally driving to pick up the robot, put it in the back of our car, drive it to the customer, and drop it on their doorstep, and then run away and hide. Um, and then it helped us measure like what are all of the things that fail? What impacts the customer experience? What should we prioritize? Because we didn't know. Some of them are obvious. Some of them are really not obvious. And um, one of our early employees dropped the robot at a customer's doorstep and then was trying to, 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 be, uh, to be subtle and so he wouldn't get discovered that he's actually just shuttling robots around. He jumped back into his car and started talking really loudly about like fixing pipes and stuff and pretended he was like a local plumber. Uh, he actually ended up putting a logo on the side of his car that said Mike's Plumbing uh, so that nobody would ever know that he is uh, essentially the robot shuttle. Um, and so we, we, we coined this term called miking that was existed for the first like two years of the company until the vehicle actually got reliable enough where we didn't need to do that anymore. Um, the, the, the chart kind of in the middle here uh, I think is a good representation of this. So um, each of those colors is a different failure in the hardware, either in hardware or software. Um, and this is today. So um, these are some things that require some sort of intervention, right? So it might mean someone has to go out and retrieve the robot. It might need the, the robot needs to go through a hard reset. It might mean the, the, you know, the cameras need to get reset, the cell connection needs to get reset, something like that. Um, this is just the top issues that we're actively working on. And the, um, I know it's hard to see, but the, the y-axis is, the top of the y-axis is 1%. So every single issue we, we work on is a, you know, a few hundredths of a percentage point. And so they're, they're, they're pretty rare by definition, but there's hundreds of them that sum up. And anyone who's worked in hardware knows that that's kind of how it goes. But this chart used to look like this, but the, the, the y-axis was like 50%. Um, so a lot of work to get that down. Um, but the beauty of it was we knew exactly what the most pressing things to work on were. And I know a lot of companies in this space and a lot of companies in hardware spaces typically will raise hundreds of millions of dollars 
and then will build what they think to be the perfect vehicle. And then when you release it to the market and it is not perfect, um, it's super slow and expensive to go and redo all of that work. And so we said we're going to start super scrappy, super lean, put the robot out and figure out what works, what doesn't, and iterate from there. So we moved very quickly on that design. This is technically our second generation vehicle, but it's probably iteration 500 on all of these little details on the inside. Um, and we've raised a, a little under 100 million to date. Um, and a lot of our competitors have raised in the hundreds of millions or billions of dollars. And we have about 1,000, a little over 1,000 vehicles operating across the US and Europe. Um, so I believe we have the largest urban fleet in, uh, in, in robot delivery, um, or one of the largest uh, fleets in uh, urban robot delivery. But we have uh, raised significantly less capital. So this approach sounds expensive, but I actually think it can get you to the end state much more capital efficiently um, than, uh, than raising a lot of money and trying to build the perfect robot from the beginning. OK, so to, to recap the, the learnings uh, that we've been through that I think would be helpful for anyone trying to build a hardware product, um, hire people early who really understand the market. If you have a real world product, you need people who live in that area where the product will be operating so they can help you translate a lot of the differences um, from the market where most of the team is. Um, so we have a really great team here in Finland now. Um, we will be doing that in every single city. Um, it's a little bit easier to other cities in the US, but um, you know, the Nordics have been uh, certainly culturally very different than in Los Angeles. Um, number two, be extremely adaptable and, 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 and fast. So you need to play the game on the field, but when it changes, you need to be able to very quickly, very quickly adapt to that. And, and founders go through that all the time, but it, it's no different for hardware companies. Um, and then the third takeaway, uh, even with hardware, simplify the design as much as you can, simplify the constraints, really focus on what you're trying to accomplish, ship the product, get it out to customers, get someone using it, and then learn from that, iterate, uh, and, and constantly, um, constantly optimize the, the product. I think a lot of the conventional advice for software products actually um, translates to hardware much more, uh, much more than people think. Um, Thank you so much for coming. Uh, I'm doing a, a Q&A right after this. So if you have any other questions or uh, you want to talk about anything, hardware, robotics, um, I'm super happy to talk about it. Thank you all.